So hello friends, welcome everybody today. So today I have Wendy Murdoch here and she is going to be talking to us really about the value of learning about our bodies, about ourselves, about our kind of internal responses to things as well as our horses and helping us find ways to learn how we through exploration can figure out how to be more secure riders, how to help our horses be more secure in themselves. And when he's gonna help us really discover the feel part, which is the meaningful part, finding that joy and that growing and, the, and finding the journey between you and your horse that means the most to both of you. Oh, I did clinics at your mom's place and you yeah. were a teenager. How long ago was that? Yeah, oh my gosh, that was like the late 90s. I've learned so much from you. I really have and I have applied it throughout all of my teachings. I mean, it really, it's something I totally integrated and have, I just love it. And you turned me on to Feldenkrais. Yeah. Which, um, I ended up taking some classes at our UW system. They had, they had some workshops on the pelvis and on, you know, the head, neck and shoulders. And uh, I went to those because of you. And oh, that's I, awesome. That's yeah. really great. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate it because it's, um, because I have arthritis too, I had limitations and, and you were able to help me learn how through alternate paths of movement, you can find actually still a really good functional body inside of you, which was pretty yeah. cool. And that's, you know, I've worked with a lot of people with arthritis and stuff, and it's amazing how when we start to look at possibilities, we realize that actually we don't have to uh, be a let, let the disease totally control our lives, right? Right. And so true of so many things that people, I, you know, like I was just doing a clinic over in, in the Netherlands and I had people, this one woman and she had, oh, how many things had she broken? Just an amazing number of things. But I, you know, and um, I was like, yeah, and that's normal. You know, like when I do clinics and I ask people, you know, about their injuries and at first they don't, they tell me, oh yeah, well, I maybe, I, I don't know, I'm fine. And then an hour later, they're, oh yeah, I forgot I broke my back two weeks ago. And <laughs> That's too funny. Oh, it's, it's hysterical. And so they start telling me all these injuries they've had. And I'm like, you, you know, your horse knows all of them because it's yeah. affected your body and you start to move differently. And so the horse has to compensate for that. And it's not like we have to have a perfect body or have no injuries. Like I will always um, have effects from the injuries I've had, but we don't have to let them override our function in terms of, uh, you know, optimum. So, you know, yeah. people with scoliosis or, you know, um, you know, whatever, broken back stuff. It's so many people I find, they think that's limiting them. And then when they find the better function, they realize it's not, which is really right. cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really neat to be able to share and help people through that because it's, it's not only just making a difference in their, their bodies, but the body and mind are so connected. Uh, which you can't separate them. You can't. You honestly can't separate them. So, so I do this thing, um, so I've taken the Surefoot pads and I, yeah. uh, um, and I use it with people now in my clinics, which a friend of mine was like, <laughs> a few years after I started, she goes, I put my students on it. It's really great. And I'm like, oh, that's a fabulous idea. So I, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I make this balance trail. And it, some people call it hopscotch. Some people call it the trail of torture. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I send everybody through it and I use um, not just your foot pads, but a variety of different unstable surfaces, right? Uh, and I have everybody go through it the first time. And after that, you know, and they all manage to, to handle all the different objects, even one that's around when we have to put both feet on. And that's kind of a challenge. Yeah. And then I tell them, well, that's like the horse being out in the field. You know, the horse in the field, he can go and find water and get hay and play and whatever. And he can deal with his own body as long as there's no outside influence. And then I put them through the trail again and I push on them. And, and that's sort of my oh, evil perfect. side. <laughs> it's like, people think it's so nice. And actually I have this little evil side because I push on them and, and I can push in different places. But the thing that, that lately I've realized it's so fascinating because I knock almost every single person off the pads, right? And the more unstable the surface, the easier. But I get people like, I did this little lecture up in Canada when I was up at the Equibo workshop. Um, and I called it um, balance versus behavior. And um, we tend to think that behavior is ruled by, uh, you know, that we can, do, we can condition out of it, right? But actually balance has so much to do with behavior. And so when I push on people, some people want to hit me. Some people get really upset. Some people want to run away. Some people feel, you know, uh, mortified. And, and those are all the emotions that horses go through when they're out of balance. 
right? Some of them want to bite or kick. Some of them want to run away. Some of them get really depressed. Some of them just kind of get sullen. Some of them just take it. Um, and that's what I think one of these people is they have the same reactions because we both have what's known as vagus nerve, which is okay. the biggest nerve in our body. 10th cranial has a piece that goes to the heart and, and the gut. And um, the biggest deal with vagus, the biggest question, whether it's a horse or a human that's being asked is, am I safe? So right. when I push on the person, they're not safe anymore, right? Because they're not balanced. And this is how we feel when we're on horseback. So whether it's on sure foot pads or on horseback or the horse itself, when we feel out of balance, we're going to react instead of act, right? Right. Um, or respond. And so then I show everybody how to be in balance because I don't want to leave them like feeling like, oh my God, <laughs> you know. So I show <laughs> them that. Mean. I know, I'm not that mean, right. Um, <laughs> so I show them... Uh, what they have to do to be in balance, and it's the same thing they have to do in riding, right? And they've got to be solid in their back and allow the knee to go forward down so that the hip can open to the degree that I'm applying a force. So it's if you do more than I'm applying, you're going to land on your face, well, actually on your knees. And if you do less, you're bracing. And it's about equal and opposite forces that you have to be able to adapt to the amount of force I'm applying and respond to that. And as soon as I do that with people, the thing that's so fascinating is several. One, they have perfect ear, shoulder, hip alignment. You don't have to tell them to look up. They automatically look up. They come up with their head because their pelvis is over their feet and they're in balance. Two, their arms drop. So I don't tell anybody about their hands and arms anymore unless I make sure that their base of support is really secure. Because without the base of support, they can't give up their hands, right? Right. So, you know, it's, this is like I see instructors tell people to do stuff with their hands, but they haven't addressed the base of support. So they can't, or if they do, they're still not secure. So they're going to grab again. Right. So I'm always looking at if I make the base of support more secure, whether it's a horse or a person, right? Sure foot for the horse and sure foot pads and then my riding stuff for the rider, then they feel more secure and then they can, they can respond. They can hear what I'm saying. They can pay attention to what the horse is doing. They can interact and have communication because they're not worrying about their balance. Right. You know? And so it's yeah. the, the more I do this, this, in a sense, the simpler it becomes in that most of the behavior I see from people and horses and especially like people riding is they're, the women are afraid. Well, why are you afraid? You feel insecure. Why are you insecure? You don't have a good base of support. Do you know you don't have a good base of support? Well, you know something's not right, but you're not sure what to do to fix it, right? You're not right. sure where to look. And the other really interesting thing with using the balance trail is I'll put my hand, say, on their belt area at the back, and I'll say, rest on my hand, and they throw their chest back, or they pull their shoulders, or they move somewhere. They're not moving where my hand is. So that body-mind thing that you mentioned, like, yeah. Um, their self-image and their and that's a whole folding Christ idea, right? Self-image. Their self-image of where to move isn't clear enough to be able to respond in a way that's going to make them secure. So we have to remap, right? They have to figure out, okay, where is my hand? It's on your lower back. It's not on your upper back. So you don't need to move your upper back or do anything there, right? You need to find my hand. And <laughs> First, they do all these habits that they don't know they have, and I can and I and I'll show them it's still not secure. And then suddenly, and it only takes like a nanosecond, suddenly they'll feel it, right? Just for a yeah. split second. And the nervous system is so amazing that as soon as there's a sense of balance, it's like, whoa, what was that? And then how do I get that back? How do I do that again? Right? <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking oh, about. You're so laughing, cool. and yeah. I can see it. <laughs> Totally. Well, you helped me find it. So it's, and, and I love, I think it's so interesting because you're pointing out how you're actually dialing it into this place where you're helping people on the ground, finding out when their vagus nerve is threatened and that that system is threatened, you're figuring out what their type of response is because it's so different. And, and I love yeah. how you say, you know, people respond differently and horses respond differently. So you need to find these responses and that's kind of getting to the root of it, right? Yeah. So you can help cr increase the awareness. And then through your mean exercises, I remember at one point, if you had me wrapped up like a mummy, I looked ridiculous. Oh, that's right. We did do that. Yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. but it was perfect because it, it, you're teaching the feel. And yeah. I think that's, that's something that people, you know, they think, oh, you can't even teach feel. 
but I, I encourage everybody go to a Wendy Murdoch clinic because she will teach you feel. And it, it's neat because the, it, it's like you hit on it and you get it. And all of a sudden your body starts seeking it out because you, you now know. Yes. So instead of, and it's a feel thing. So it's yes. not like you're saying, put this here, put that there. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is you're saying, you know, what's happening and you're questioning the body and you're encouraging the body to find it. Yeah. And then, and then when it does, it's magical, right? Yeah. And yeah. then people can find it on their own. They don't yes. need somebody to Absolutely. be telling them. And that's the point is that, um, you know, first of all, I, when I work, I work through movement, right? And you know that most of my teaching, like the balance trail. And I always tell people, that's how horses learn. They learn through movement. And we're actually, we learn through movement too, but we forget we right. forgot that all that childhood development was movement. We didn't really have language or really any kind of intellectual concept until we're well in our 20s, right? Right. I mean, so we're, right? So we're learning through movement. So, so we're just like the horses and, and that there's no language in the motor part of the brain. So since riding is so much about movement, trying to put words on it is really, really difficult. So I keep the words to an absolute minimum right? Really simple, but I give them a lot of feeling. And I, and like, you know, I'll show them like the board under the foot to where to feel the foot on, in relation to the stroke and the pressure. And um, just everything I do is about experiences. But that's the thing is that I, you know, like movement is like when we learn through movement, we own it too. That's the other piece, right? And so that's the piece with the balance trail or mounted work that I do is I don't tell people to do this or that. I give them options and then I let the horse vote. And then I go, okay, go back, you know, go back and forth between the old place and the new place. Yep. <laughs> and the horses with sure foot, they do that all by themselves. You don't have to tell them that you'll watch them. They'll go back and forth and they'll tense the neck and let it go and tense the neck and let it go. But people give me the hardest time about this, right? They tell people to go back and forth between the old place and the new place and people complain about it right they don't want to go back to the old place they're oh, right um they don't want to experiment but you know what i always tell them is if i'm not there how are you going to find the new place if you don't map it out right, right. <laughs> so it's about experimentation and exploration rather than getting it right or wrong i mean there's no wrong it's just you know what does this do when you do this and what happens when you do this and the horse gets to vote right he gets right. to show you which one makes more sense to him right yeah. yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. And I think it's so important for us to recognize that and be able to read our horse's responses and to know if it's working for the horse as well. Right. And that's yeah. so nice to have there actually a tool, a biofeedback tool for us to tell us where we need to be. Oh, they're and, the biggest biofeedback on the planet, right? And they're yeah. so fast. They're so fast. They are. Yeah. And they're so new. I mean, it's just like the littlest thing, right? And they're, yeah. they're giving... And the hard part is that people don't realize... You know, um, I one time had a student, she was fairly novice, and I put her on my reining horse, Blondie, okay. and I, you know, I gave her a lesson, and she said something to me that was so profound at the end of the lesson. She said, if I hadn't been there, she would have thought what the horse was doing was, was not listening to her. But in fact, the horse was doing everything her body was saying, and she didn't know what she was saying, so she thought the horse was misbehaving. Right. And it was such an eye-opener because I was like, wow, um, how often do people misunderstand that actually what they thought and what they did were two different things? Like um, when people have problems with canter, I take them off the horse and I watch them canter on the ground because I can see what their thought of canter is. And so often what they think they should do for canter is not what they should do for it. Like they turn or they twist or they drag a leg or then they wonder why the horse doesn't canter well, right? And so I improve their canter on the ground so they have a clear understanding of what canter motion is. And when they get back on the horse, it's so much better because now they're giving the horse a clear message about what they want. Right. And it's like, it's so important that we take the time to stop and ask, do we really understand what that movement is? Or do we really understand what the instructor said? Or does the instructor make it really clear about how to use our body and what they're asking, right? right? So, so many times, you know, like a lateral work is a big, big one. You know, people say, well, I want to start doing lateral work. I'm like, great, get off your horse and show me leg yields. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have it, you know, they do all kinds of things and they don't have a clear picture, right? 
So there's no wonder that the horse can't do leg yield because they're not clear about it. Right. And you know, when the trainer gets on, the trainer has a clear picture in their mind and body. It goes together and the horse does it. And then they wonder why, why can't I do it? Well, you're not clear enough about what you're doing and how to do the movement. And Right. You know, I tell people all the time, get on all fours, crawl around on the ground. Yep. Make sure you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, because if, if you can't, can't do it on your own four feet, you know, um, yeah. then how are you going to understand what it is the horse needs to do, especially if the horse is learning, right? Right. No, I think that's, that's great. And I think it's, I think it's so empowering to people as well because a lot of people they get into this place where they're like well i can't and i'm struggling and it's just never right and you're giving them such key tools to really break break it down allow them to find the feel allow them to feel the organization of the hoof falls as the horse does yep. like the older does and not feel feel embarrassed or wrong i mean i i've taken <laughs> you know like upper level riders and watch them do flying changes and go Okay, that's why you're having a problem. So yeah. it's not about, you know, some people think, oh, why do I have to go back and do that? Because everybody needs to know you can, right? I like, I mean, you need to know you can. And that's where you can break it down and sort it out and really make it clear. Because if you're not clear, how is the horse supposed to do it? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. So um, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got here because you are like a just this wealth of knowledge and it goes so deep and it's so varied and it applies to absolutely any discipline how did this <laughs> how did it happen like what happened to get you here well i always say that gravity is not discipline specific right right so you know when people say well i ride western or i ride this right i'm like gravity doesn't care what saddle you're sitting in what kind of horse you're on or what discipline you ride right so right. um i have uh i was in uh undergrad for animal science and then i went to grad school for equine reproductive physiology which is horse hormones right okay. and um, while i was there i was managing an event barn and we had a bunch of horses we'd gotten from georgia and so I wanted to be a tough event rider. So I thought, okay, there's this one horse that I knew it could rear and I was gonna, gonna ride it. And I, and I got on and it reared up and hit me in the face, but you gotta be tough, right? You can't let the horse win. Uh, at least that's what I thought at the time. Right. And he uh, flipped over and then he rolled over me and punched my femur through the socket and then kicked me between the legs when he got up and broke my pelvis in two places oh. on the right. So needless to say, they scraped me off the ground, took me to the hospital, and I had surgery the next day, and um, I had three pins in my left hip socket. So, you know, 15 seconds, and it changed my life, and I was about 20, I was 27. So um, I got back on a horse in six months, a little tiny gray pony, about 13 hands, and because um, I was determined to get back on. And the thing was that because I had this, I mean, when they did the surgery, I have this huge incision on the, le on the left side of my leg. It's called a Mercedes incision because it costs that much. <laughs> it's the symbol, it's the Mercedes symbol, right? And, um, so, um, you know, it, they cut through all this muscle. And so I didn't have the strength in my leg. I didn't have the function in my leg. And most normal instructors, they don't know how to deal with people that are that injured. They just don't know what to tell them. So um, a year after my accident, I went to my, I, I met Linda Tellington Jones. Somebody gave me a, a newsletter while I was laying in the hospital. And I went to her training a year later and I walked in and it, and it was obvious that this was a good place for me because it was such a different approach. And Linda's the one who introduced me to the Feldenkrais method. So, because oh, okay. she had taken the Feldenkrais training with Dr. Feldenkrais in the 70s in San Francisco. Wow, okay. Yep, so that's where team came from, was this combination of the Feldenkrais method and Linda's horse knowledge. So that's where I got exposed to the Feldenkrais method. And then a year later, I was at another um, training with Linda in Connecticut, and Sally Swift was there. So that's where I met Senator Sally Swift. And so then I started working with her, and I apprenticed with her in 92. But you know, the thing for me is being a scientist by training, it's got to make sense to me and I have to figure out how it logically works within like the known laws, right? And, and with the body. So there were a lot of times when an instructor would tell me something and even some things with centered riding that didn't make sense to me. And so I, you know, I really would break it down and I'd 
really look at it. And of course, I met Joyce Harmon. Um, you know Joyce. I do. Um, I met her in 1990 and um, learned about saddles from Tony Gonzalez and Joyce and Andy Foster. And of course, um, you know, took, just took a lot of training with, you know, Dr. Clayton and John Zahorek because, you know, I just have this, this desire to understand how things work. So I, I right. you know, added the anatomy and um, the biomechanics. Um, and then I finally went back and took the Feldenkrais training starting in 2001 and trained for 16 years with, I did the guild training in the United States. And then I trained with Mia Siegel. She was Feldenkrais's assistant for 15 years before he started training. And she was, she's friends with Linda because she was assisting Dr. Feldenkrais at the training that Linda took. Sure. So it's this really interesting thing because the, the circles keep completing over and over. Yeah, and I that's think you probably so cool. find that. Um, so yeah, so I added the Feldenkrais training, uh, the formally training, and I just use that every single day in my teaching. And it's, it's so powerful. And you know, when people come to me and ask me, well, what should I do if I want to be a better teacher, a better instructor? I'm like, take the Feldenkrais training yeah. because it's, it's, it's the root of movement. It's the root of function. And it's really that function and understanding movement in our own body that's going to help us understand function in the horse function in our students, you know, and, and it's just so powerful to go through that process as you, as you know, cause you've been doing some building price work. And it's, it's so, Again, I, I keep seeing empowering, but it really, this work that you do in the Feldenkrais work, it really empowers us to listen to our body and to learn from them and to explore and to question. And yeah. I think that's where the, these true breakthroughs actually occur. Is, yeah. Is yeah. It's so much in the experimentation as opposed yeah. to like trying to get it right. It's like I, when you, when you let go of right and start looking at, well, what's going on right now? Yeah. Um, and really getting present with what's happening with the horse or what's happening with yourself. That's where really the magic happens. And that's, that's why I love Surefoot so much, because it's really about being very present with the horses and observing and really seeing like the pads are like a magnifying glass. So when you put a horse on a pad, you see like a breathing change in three to 10 seconds, where you see eye blinks or lip lick and chew or neck lowering. And then you can watch how they're balancing over that foot and how they organize in relation to the foot, which is key for the horse because that's all he gets is his foot. You know, the, like, so Surefoot, uh, I discovered um, in 2012, and it was another 15 second moment of like, uh, you know, mind blowing change um, when I put the first horse on a pad. But the thing that's so uh, meaningful with Surefoot for me is that we give the horses the chance to show us what's going on with them. So it's not training, it's an offer, and we're there to facilitate, and there's no fail. So even if a horse doesn't stand on a pad, which you know doesn't happen that often, but does happen, um, you learn so much about the horse. Like I, I was just in Canada and I had this horse, and for three days, he didn't stand on a pad. But what we realized was the size of his bubble, how he didn't feel safe, how to help him feel safe, how to help him become curious and then trusting so that we could start to offer. And then yesterday I got an email and the owner has his foot on the pad. And it's so <laughs> exciting because she, she had been pushing him more than he was really ready for, but she didn't realize it, you know? And so, um, and he's, he was born this way. You know, he wasn't, nothing happened to this horse. She bred him, but he came out really, really sensitive. And so she's done a lot with him and he's a really neat horse. I love him. Um, but this, you know, his, the whole issues about his feet and what he touches and how he reacts to it. He's dumped her quite a few times because of it, because he's so quick and he would get disturbed. But when we really broke it down and really looked at the smaller details and how to help him trust to overcome those anxieties and, and really feel safe with the person. We're going back to safety, right? Now, now he's learning how to trust her and that he has a choice so he can approach or he can step back or, you know, like I let him like hide behind me and look at the pad, but she really got to see just how deep this goes and how important it is to work it through 
for, for everybody's safety and comfort, right? Right. So that's what I love about Surefoot is it's, it's, it's like, it's Feldenkrais. It's totally Feldenkrais, right? Yeah. It's this whole idea of exploration and no fail and learning and observing. And, and the cool thing about the horses is that it's so profound to them that when you watch, you know, it's so hard to watch a video and really get what it's about. When you see yeah. a horse stand on a Surefoot pad and you see the degree of relaxation, and then the fact that it carries on afterward, which I still don't understand. Like, right, I'm a scientist, right, by training. And I have <laughs> asked so many people the past seven years, what do you think is happening? How do you think this is working? And we all have our guesses. But yeah. That's what they are. They're, they're guesses. They're educated guesses, right? Uh -huh. um, but we, we don't totally know how it's working. We just see that it really does work. Um, right. And, and it does work like not just at the time the horse is on the pad, but um, the effects can last. Like I was, my horse dentist was working on my horse uh, a few months ago. And she said, you know that sure foot pad you have? I'm like, yeah. She said, I have a client and the horse had to be tranquilized for the farrier. And they did sure foot with that horse two times. And now they don't have to tranquilize him anymore. Wow. And I was like, wow, that's awesome, that right? It is. <laughs> really cool. And this is a story, you know, I, I don't even know the person she's talking about. I don't know the horse. I just know that they got the pad and they did the process. And now everybody's safer and the horse is better, right? Right, right. Like, wild. It is wild. You know, my mom told me, because, you know, my parents have a farm and stuff. And just because yeah. you've been there and you've talked there. <laughs> so right. my mom has the Surefoot. I haven't experimented it with it, oh, but exactly. yeah. I need to, because she told me, she's like, you really have to try this. It's just, it's so interesting. And she's like, when I, when I put cashmere on it, it makes such a difference in how she is. She just totally melts. And, and I was like, Huh, because my mom's I, I just, it's like the weirdest concept. It's the weirdest concept. <laughs> I'm the first one to admit that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, how, how exactly did you, I mean, like. So, okay, so it's like, obviously it comes out of my Feldenkrais experiences. Yeah. And um, I had this horse that I would see him uh, two days a month, Monday, Tuesday, every month. And in the past, in the month between, um, she changed the saddle and she put a jumping saddle on it was crooked and it put some pressure on the right back corner and so then the farrier quicked the horse and when I saw him he was lame in the right hind leg and so we switched back to the dressage saddle just to see if that made a difference and the horse was a bit better but he really wasn't totally better so I knew I was going to see her the next day and I'm thinking about her and it, and then I went home and um, I was talking to Do Joyce Harmon um, Dr. Joyce Harmon because she's where my horse lives actually is the, her house oh really okay. oh yeah <laughs> Really I tried like to get Joyce on. I, I tried to get Joyce on for the fair, and she was just too busy and didn't have time to get it all. Together. Oh, that's too bad. That would have been great. Um, yeah. But anyway, so she's she's amazing. Um, she is. Yeah, she's really amazing. So anyway, this was in 2012 when standing desks were just becoming popular, and she's like, "I want to stand at my computer instead of sit." I'm like, okay, and then I want to stand on a pad. And so then she, while we're talking, she said, "You know, they put dogs on pads for rehabilitation." And so I'm tapping away on my laptop while I'm talking to her and I'm looking at these pictures of dogs on different pads. And I said to her, do you think that would work for a horse? And she said, I don't know, but just, you know, when you do it, just time it for 15 seconds. I'm like, okay. So I grab something out of my shed and I drive to the lesson and all my students are used to me doing crazy things, right? So, <laughs> so I walk up and I go, um, I'm going to stick this pad under your horse's foot. And she's on the horse, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I stick it underneath and I time it for 15 seconds and the horse walks off. He's totally different. 15 seconds. And I'm like, what happened? So ah. we spent the, the rest of the time just messing with it. And I could only do his back feet. I couldn't do it. He wouldn't let me do anything with his front feet. Fine. No problem. Uh -huh. Next horse was a quarter horse that had done Western pleasure and the woman wanted to vent. So she, the canner wasn't very good. So he loved the front feet, but didn't want the back feet. But in an hour we had a round canner. And then the next horse was a halflinger. In an hour, we had a round canner. And I'm like, I don't know what this is, but this is something. This is meaningful to the horses. Yeah. So I start calling up my, my dressage friends. I'm like, can I come over and do this weird thing your horse? And they're like, sure, come on over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, then I got on a plane and I flew out to Washington State to do a clinic. And I didn't take anything with me. And I got out there and I was looking at this horse. I'm like, oh, I, I need to put a pad under his foot. So somebody had something in their house 
and we just messed around and and all the horses changed and i'm like this is so cool so then i flew home and then went off to holland right um a little bit of jet lag there but anyway, <laughs> i go to holland and um i take my pad with me and i work with this horse and i video it and i go to mia siegel right and i say mia watch this video tell me what you see and she's watching and she's like look look there there's changes in c6 c7 and now look the pelvis just changed and she's i'm on the horse what? in the video and she's watching and she's saying look there, there's the change there and there's the change there and you could see it all these changes right and i was like wow that's really amazing so i just started putting pads underneath every horse i could find you know and i've yeah. been here for seven and a half years now and i have um Veterinarians using it as rehab, like um, Dr. Rachel Bellini, she's amazing. She's a holistic vet. She just wrote a post on my um, Surefoot page uh, all about stability. She put two parts and just validating the importance of stability in horses and how we take it for granted. And really, you know, it's like people. You know, we think horses are athletes. Okay, great. So that they really know where their feet are. Not true, right? Or that they really are grounded. Not true. And, um, you know, they're, they're just like us. They get injured, they change, they get habits, you know, they have a bad fitting saddle or their teeth were bad and then they finally got it fixed, but they have a habit. And um, I've talked to Dr. Robert Bowker, you know, he's this really amazing guy up at Michigan State. He's now retired studying horses feet and looking at all the, the nerve endings in the foot and the whole neurology of the hoof. And, um, you know, it's, you start to realize, well, I did, how important the hoof really is like yeah. we take it for granted we take it for granted you're going to get on your horse you're going to go out you know in colorado and go chase some cows and that horse is going to put his feet down just right every single stride so that right. you can you know canter across the the, the the horizon over all kinds of terrain and your horse is going to stay upright with you on its back right, right. And right. that's all because the foot gives reports back to the brain and the brain gives reports back to the foot so that it lands in the right place. Right, right. You know, and the more you think about it, the and it works perfectly more, every time, right? <laughs> yeah, and the more stunning, more, you know, amazed I am at how incredible the system is, the design of the system to give the feedback, to organize everything so that you can, you know, like, go over an event course and have the horse land and actually stay upright right. <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> um, and, and that how important that foot is to meet the ground. And so if you have a horse, like I have people actually that are starting horses and they put them on sure foot pads before they start them because the more balanced the horse is, the easier they're going to start. And I have people with rehab. I have one person out in Colorado and whenever they get a horse in for training, they put it on sure foot pads and so many of the problems that were the reason why the horse came to them go away, right? Does it have to do with like the proprioception or like what part of it? Uh, so, you know, there's, that's the thing is there's so much going on in that foot. You've got the proprioceptors, which tell us where we are in space. Yeah. You've got fascia, you've yeah. got Pacinian receptors, Ruffini receptors, you've got acupuncture ting points. I mean, I'm starting to think of the feet as like four brains, four little brains down at the end of the leg that have to report back to the central brain to tell everybody, hey, this is where we are and this is the timing, right? And right. so if there's a misfire or a misconnection or, you know, something's created a habit like the horse, say he got injured. And so now he's just like a person offloaded that leg for a while. He's not going to move the same unless we bring back the function, restore it to function the way it was before the injury. It's almost encouraging a reorganization of the entire body through all, yep. everything, because it's all connected. So it's through- That's you know, right. It's you are. You're reorganizing the entire body in relation to the foot because the foot's what meets the ground. And how that foot meets the ground is going to determine how that whole system organizes in relation to that foot, right? So right. the horse, with a thousand pound horse, you've got a 40 pound head at the end of a three foot lever arm of the neck right, with the center of mass at the 13th to 14th bridge and the counterweight of the bridge eight feet away from the head, at least, right? <laughs> I mean, from a mechanics perspective, this thing is amazing organizing. And so that foot has to hit the ground in such a way to keep the whole system upright. Yeah. And if, say, that horse, and this is one of the things you can see on surefoot pads, 
you know, I look at the foot and I, I think of 12 o'clock being straight ahead and six o'clock at the back, three, nine, right? So I think of a clock and you can see where horses have more pressure at say one, two, and three on the right foot and uh, 10, 11 on the left. So that they're, they're dropping their weight in. Well, that's going to affect where the shoulder is relative to the foot. And so say you have that on one foot and you want to make a turn and the horse is dropping in on that foot in terms of weight load and the shoulder leans out, well, the horse is going to have to go with the shoulder weight leaning out because it's not underneath, the foot's not underneath the shoulder. Right. So, you know, if you so, want to be balanced, you've got to so, have the foot in the right place. Yeah, it's so interesting because it goes right back to where you started in the beginning with the vagus nerve. Yeah. How absolutely. is your reaction when you get, you know, out of being stable, when you're threatened? And, and this is what I'm seeing so often that when I put horses on surefoot pads that are behavior problems or, you know, people want to call them resistant or they're, you know, um, they're pushy or they're, you know, whatever behavior you want, you want to attribute. I, I put them on surefoot pads and they get grounded and pretty soon those behaviors, I mean, literally can disappear in minutes or less. So I, I went to one place and they had this thoroughbred, they were a thoroughbred rehab center. And I had 15 minutes because I was catching a flight. And I walk in the barn and I look at this gray horse and I was like, I want your gray horse. She says, no, 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 he's a butthead. I'm like, I really want your gray horse now, you know? Like, no, 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 he's such a butthead. You don't want that horse. I'm like, yes, I do. So finally she relented. She brought the horse out. I had the half physio pad, which we usually use to like when farriers are working this stuff to make a horse more comfortable. Anyway, it's all I had with me, right? So I put the foot on the, on the pad, right front foot. And in 10 seconds, this horse dropped its neck, closed its eyes, and she was completely blown away because all the behavior stopped, like stopped, wow. right? No wow. chain biting, no throwing his head around, no fussing, no stomping. And it was like in 15 seconds. And wow. I've seen this before. So, you know, I wasn't surprised. She was completely blown away. And, and it's like, is this horse a butthead or is this horse unbalanced and insecure? And it's a thoroughbred off the track where so many of the horses have, you know, that classic racehorse shoeing, which doesn't give them good support, right? And so literally in, in 15 seconds, this horse just took a big breath and just closed his eyes and was just like, oh, thank you, right? So how much of it could be just discomfort, you know, foot sore or, you know, feeling fought like they're falling or, you know, think about it. Think about, I take a hold of your head and you feel like you're falling and I tell you, you can't move. You know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, right? How are you going to feel? You're right. going to get upset. Yeah. Right? You're going to say, wow, you know, you're telling me right. I have to stand still, but you've got the thing I need to balance. My head, I can't put it where I need it. It weighs 40 pounds at the end of a three foot lever arm. <laughs> and I, you know, and I uh -huh. need to bring it over here and you're telling me not to do that. Now, what do I do? Right. You know, I move. And then you're yelling at me because I moved because I was trying to touch my balance. Yeah. yeah, that is so interesting. That is yeah. absolutely fascinating. I will be going over to my parents and good about time. Yeah, <laughs> playing and the role with it. You know, and like with Vegas nerve, Vegas like unhappy Vegas is can go either hyper or hypo. But horses that fool around, they're not okay. Like so many times we, we think of horses as just being behavior problems when they're messing around and that, you know, go to pick up their foot and they drag it out of your hand or they paw with it. And we, and we think that, oh, you're just being a, a, a stupid horse or you're just, you know, um, spoiled. Right. But those horses are actually not okay. Those horses are unsympathetic too high. And so Vegas is not happy. And when you offer them comfort and they feel secure, those behaviors go away. And I, I, I had another horse, I remember, for the first day of the clinic, it was two-day clinic, he would just, he would paw and paw and paw, and i try to put his foot on a pad, and he'd drag his leg out of my hand, and I'm not going to hold him if he's going to do that, right? But he would just throw his leg and throw his leg, and I, I got him on a pad a little bit, and I didn't worry about it. Next day, he comes in the ring, I can put all four feet on a pad, switched off like a light, fell asleep. Wow. So, you know, how much of it is that they just feel like the little kid in class that fools around that gets the negative attention because they're not okay right and they're they're feeling uncomfortable and then if we can make them comfortable the next thing the behavior has gone rather than constantly trying to deal with a behavior that's really right. a balance problem right right and i'm not sure if it's not going to work 100 percent. nothing no. works 100 percent, right we all know right. that but 
it's worth the try because when it works, it's, it's like so amazing. And you can, sure, if it's portable, I have people take it to the horse shows. They put the horses on the pads before the competition. You yeah. can use it pre and post exercise. I have people with endurance, women in Australia, and she used the pads at the Shaharazad 400K endurance ride where they're doing 80K a day. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and she did two to three minutes per horse. And at the end of the ride, she didn't see any of the compression patterns in the horses that she'd seen for the past six years when she'd done the ride. So she had really? seen like, yeah, soreness that would start up in the withers and then work down because they're on bitumen and it's cambered. So sloped tar roads. And yep. this time she didn't see that. So two to three minutes per horse, just imagine your endurance horses, how much better they're going to be if we oh, can yeah. uh, right, reset them at every break. It's not illegal. Cause it's just, you know, it's not a drug. No, no. They're just standing so, on something. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. anywhere you want your horse to be calmer, more confident, you know, more secure, better behaved, that's where you can use Surefoot. And um, I've literally yes. stopped at a lesson and put the horse on pads and gotten immediately after the pads, something that we were trying to get for 45 minutes until I thought about using the pads. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That is just so fascinating and so, yeah. so just out of this, you know, thought, I know. just completely out there. And, yeah. but when you explain it, I can completely see how it does all the things you do with us people. Yeah. Help us reorganize and find security within through being in balance with gravity. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly. exactly. It's like, like yeah, because you know, you've, since you've worked with me, you, you know that that's really what I'm after with people. And this just does it for the horse. And, you know, like I put people on the surefoot pads, but the difference with horses is we see this deep level of relaxation. They look super tranquil. Like they'll even like close their eyes and they, they look like they're sleeping, but they're not. They're just really internally processing. And the reason I know that is because when you take them off, you let them walk for you know, a minute or two if it's their first time, and you can go right to trot or canter, right? So they're not asleep. They're just really experiencing something so profound that's internal, that's important to them, that the feedback system from the foot, which we don't fully understand, is making a huge shift in the brain, huge yeah. shift. That is so neat. And I think it's so important for people to hear that um, the horse's behaviors are not, they're, they're, they're an expression of what they're feeling inside. They're yeah. not the behavior and the things that we kind of will mentally attribute to the behavior. Right. They're not being bad or being naughty or it's, it's what's going on inside. And when you can address that and address it so easy, I mean, what a simple, what's well, worth a, worth a try for anybody, right? Absolutely. It's worth a try. And that's what I tell people. It's like, you know, it, because like in rehab, if you have a horse that's laid up, you do all the other legs that are okay, because then you can keep all the little tiny postural muscles in play. You can keep them working while the horse is laid up so that you're not deconditioning completely. And so then when the vet gives the okay, you do the leg that's been injured and you always start with hard and work from hard to soft, right? Unless like if you have a laminated horse, then you go to soft. You just give them as much comfort as you can. Um, right. But, you know, that's all explained on the, uh, um, I have a lot of, a lot of videos and stuff on my YouTube channel, Murdoch Method, okay. and okay. there's tons of videos about Surefoot there, and you can see lots right. of horses, and on my Facebook page, Surefoot Equine, because it's, you really need to at least watch video of this to see yeah. what's going on, and it's like, like your mom has been telling you, so that's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. And I really, it's, it's ridiculous with this fair and stuff. I haven't ridden, it, I've ridden maybe three times in the last four months. It's been, this has been amazing. This it's fair. It's like really caught on like wildfire, hasn't it, it? It has. I'm really excited. I'm really excited. And what I, you know, what I really like about it is um, I've, I've done all these different disciplines and I always feel like it's one's pitting against the other. And I just don't like that feel because there's so much to be gained right. from everybody and having this eclectic mix of people and what a rich learning experience. And so I'm so excited about that piece of it because yeah. like people that would not have ever found you are now going to find you. Yeah, it's and, awesome. And they're going to resonate, you know, or not all of them because they might not be ready for it and that's okay. Right. But right. it can be exposed 
and not have to, you know, pack up and travel and do all the stuff that is required of going to a fair, which some right. people don't get to them. Right. And, oh. you know, like, um, I've been going to uh, Equitana in Germany, in Essen, Germany, yeah. which is the biggest horse expo in the world. It's nine days. It's, uh, I've forgotten how many square meters of floor space, like 250,000 people through the door. It's a madhouse. And it's nine days. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a like, house. <laughs> you know, it's like exhausting, but it's also amazing. And, um, you know, it, it's to bring, you know, that kind of level here, it's really hard to do, but see through online, you can get all those people together where people can get exposed to them. It's really awesome. Yeah. Well, cool. And I so appreciate you doing this interview and people are going to get so much. It's just like jam packed with information. So <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm so glad you're doing this. It's great. It's really awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you everybody for, for watching the interview and joining Wendy and I. And um, I appreciate you all for joining us, all of us the presenters and people on this journey of launching a new kind of event. That's um, Yeah. And, okay. and really the bottom line is having a better relationship with your horse, yeah, right? That's right. really the bottom line is that we you know, through this experience, people can gather information so that they can improve that relationship with their horse, which is just so important. That's what it's all about. It it's, is. Uh, you know, it is. It's that, it's that journey, isn't it? And it's, and it's um, the experimentation and that it, it's okay to be, be wrong. Just play around and you'll kind of find what yeah, works. Yeah, we're childlike. And you know, when we were kids, like I didn't have a pony when I was a kid, but I had a horse and I did all kinds of things that, you know, I never told my mom, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I would not tell her I had, you know, some of the things I did, but you know, in that child mind, you just play with stuff. You don't have any judgment. You're not like trying to get it right or wrong. And obviously when we're older, we do have to think of safety. And so that's where if we listen to Vegas and we listen to our own self and go, okay, this makes me nervous. What do I have to do to make myself feel safe? But then we can also, by doing that, have the exploration of going, well, what, you know, what is that about? And how can I feel safe? And how can I make it better for me and my horse and really have a good time? Right, right. Cool. Well, thank you for that, Wendy. We appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Thanks so much. All right. Well, bye, everybody. Bye.